Have you ever thought about getting your MBA? Well, the University of Louisville offers the only MBA with a distilled spirits focus, so you can graduate in under two years with both your master's and a certificate in the distilled spirits business at no extra time or cost to you. This unbeatable combination is going to prepare you to achieve greater success through deepened understanding of the business side of the spirits industry, like things like marketing, finance, and operations. So this is also 100% online, so you can access the courses at any time and anywhere. So what are you waiting for? All that's required is a bachelor's degree. Go to uofl.me slash bourbon pursuit. The Meltdown Ice Press is an engineering marvel, and it turns ice into a work of art by using metal conduction to create a perfect sphere every single time. And it's 100% made in the U.S. But ice balls provide 24% less surface area, which means it's a slower ice melt and less drink dilution. So go check it out now at MeltdownIce.com. If you're looking to upgrade your sleep, do it today with a Bear mattress. You're guaranteed to get the proper back support, pressure relief, and comfort or your money back. Every Bear mattress is proudly made in the USA and comes with two free pillows. Try the top-rated Bear mattress risk-free for 100 nights. You can learn more at BearMattress.com slash bourbon. That's B-E-A-R mattress.com slash bourbon. How do I set nice. Set mine. It always more works. country than normal. Yeah. <laughs> oh yeah, this is a setting for that. For it's sure. okay. Yeah, we just we'll fix that on the the dials. Give of the me variant. a British accent. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Lauren can't edit, a, edit we, that out. Yeah, I don't know. That's a little tough. We can't if we can do the, the accent on there. Good day, mate. <laughs> <laughs> was that British? <laughs> <laughs> what was that? that was Australian. The Australian, <laughs> maybe. Who knows. This is episode 298 of Bourbon Pursuit, the podcast featuring news, reviews, and interviews with people making the bourbon whiskey industry happen. I'm one of your hosts, Kenny Coleman, and before we start today's podcast, talking to Nick and Dan from Bardstown Bourbon Company, here's your weekly bourbon news update. We've talked about Kentucky House Bill 415 on the podcast plenty of times before, because that is going to be the catalyst that will drive other states to open up direct-to-consumer shipping and a lot more. Well, there's a new update to the bill, and it was signed into law last week. And that big update is that distilleries in Kentucky can now sell direct to consumers and completely bypass the three-tier system without any transfer going to a wholesaler. And this new law change to the process comes when a bottle moves from a bonded warehouse to the visitor center and is now up to the distiller to create the paper trail and pay all the excise, wholesale, and sales taxes, plus any other local regulatory license fees. So by cutting out the middleman, distillers are able to keep more revenue from each bottle that's being sold at the distillery. And this includes sealed bottles that are sold at retail, samples served to visitors, bottles shipped via common carriers, and spirits used to make cocktails at their bar or the restaurant. So we're all moving in the right direction. Woodford Reserve is announcing a new distillery expansion that will double its production capacity with three new copper pot stills, a new building that will house the boiler plant, additional fermentation tanks, a grain unloading area, a barrel unloading and storage area, and a conference and training center for employees. Construction will begin this spring and is expected to be completed in the summer of 2022 with no planned interruptions, so it will be fully operational, so keep on visiting. And now moving on to bourbon release news. Old Forester is announcing a new limited expression lineup called the 117 series that is led by Old Forester master taster Jackie Zykin. Not only is this project one of her endeavors to feature the many facets of Old Forester bourbon, but this label will also bear her name, cementing her place in Old Forester's 150-year history, featuring a woman's signature on the label. The first release is called the High Angel Share, to show the qualities in low-yield barrels, and will come at 110 proof. This release will be available at the Old Forester Distilling Company and select Kentucky retailers for $50. Lux Road Distillers is launching Blood Oath Pact 7, featuring a combination of three Kentucky straight bourbon whiskeys, a 14 and an 8-year bourbon, and an 8-year bourbon finished in Salterns casks. Salterns is a sweet white wine from the small town of Salterns in the Bordeaux region of France. It will be available on retail shelves starting in mid-April, and Blood Oath Pact 7 has a limited allocation of just over 17,000 cases at a suggested retail price of $100 per bottle. The first Booker's Batch of 2021 is set for release and is called Donahoe's Batch. 
and this batch is named in honor of Mike Donahoe. He's a retired Jim Beam employee and a close friend of the sixth generation master distiller, Booker No. And he worked alongside Booker to create and bring Booker's bourbon to the store shelves. Mike first joined the Jim Beam company back in 1982 as a sales manager after retiring from a seven year career in the NFL. After Booker and Mike bonded over their love of football, Booker invited Mike over to his office for, of course, a glass of bourbon. It was unlike any Jim Beam bourbon that Mike had tried before, so Booker let him in on a little secret. He'd been playing with something different, and he'd share a bit with his friends from time to time. And a few years later, Mike approached Booker with the idea to give bottles of his special stash as holiday gifts to their most important distributors and industry partners. With little time and minimal budget, Booker sourced wine bottles from a warehouse in Bardstown and wrote the labels himself to get the job done. Following the hundreds of letters that they received raving about their uncut and unfiltered whiskey, it's safe to say that the rest is Booker's bourbon history. This release will be six years, seven months, and seven days with a proof of 127.3 with a suggested retail price of $90. On today's show, we get to feature two great people over at the Bardstown Bourbon Company, Dan Calloway and Nick Smith. Bardstown Bourbon Company exploded on the scenes as a destination hotspot for anyone visiting the trail, and Dan was instrumental into that early success of creating a red carpet environment for anyone who visited. And as whiskey production ramped up, Nick Smith brought his knowledge from working at Jim Beam to help customers create custom mash bills and guide them in the right direction so they could put a new spin on the distillation process that would be uniquely theirs. So next time you're headed to Bardstown, don't forget to make Bardstown Bourbon Company a must visit. Also, I did promise Nick and Dan that their Instagram accounts would blow up after this. So make sure you go follow BBC underscore Whiskey Nick and Danny Bardstown with the link in our show notes. Barrel Bourbon is known for their expertise in crafting unique blends, taking lots of different whiskeys from different regions and bottling it at cask strength. And you can now even buy them online. Just visit BarrelBourbon.com and click the Buy Now button. With that, enjoy today's episode. And now here's Fred Minnick with Above the Char. I'm Fred Minnick, and this is Above the Char. This week's idea comes from Devin Ward. Devin writes me on FredMinnick.com. On the podcast, it would be neat to hear your thoughts on bourbon-branded credit cards. It would seem like it would be a moneymaker for Buffalo Trace, for example. I know if I was allowed to earn points toward allocated bourbons, I'd sign up yesterday. Well, Devin over here is a bit of a thinker about ways he can uh, uh, get some, uh, some sweet bourbon in his hands and, um, and not have to pay the full amount and maybe get the, get the bottle. This is kind of a loaded uh, question. First of all, I love uh, branded uh, credit cards. I have a couple of them. My favorite is my USAA uh, VFW one because I know that all of my my points and everything go toward helping the VFW, which I'm a, I'm a member of. It's the Veterans of Foreign Wars. Great organization. Very incredible. Uh, but I don't think it's actually legal for a bourbon company to do this. Simply because that you're you're basically you're suggesting like a a retail centric uh, payoff, and I do think it would be a cool way for them to do it for like a charity or something. But I don't think they could pull it off. Uh, in some states, it's actually illegal to have coupons for alcohol, and it's illegal uh, to have like loyalty rewards programs for alcohol. It was illegal to do that in Kentucky up until you know, last year. Because I remember like going to Kroger and Total Wine and putting, you know, trying to use like a point system and I couldn't use it because it was against the law here. So I don't think they could pull it off, but I think it's a great idea. And if I could get a uh, Buffalo Trace uh, Visa card to, to get that uh, Buffalo Trace Antique collection. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Sign me up. I'd be getting airline, you know, buying all my airline tickets, all my food, everything. Unfortunately, I think that's one of those that's probably. Far too many laws and far too many states that won't allow it. But great idea, Devin. Great idea. And that's this week's Above the Char. Hey, if you're like Devin and you have an idea for Above the Char, hit me up on fredminnick.com. That's fredminnick.com. And click the contact button and shoot me your idea. Until next week, cheers. Welcome back to the episode of Bourbon Pursuit, the official podcast of bourbon 
Kenny and Ryan on the road, not too far from our house, but if you are watching on video, maybe you're salivating right now because we're in the vintage library at the Bardstown Bourbon Company. Yeah, I mean, this is epic. I, I can't believe they let us set up in here by ourselves. I mean, I'm about halfway buzzed. You know, I had about, <laughs> I had about six pours of Chessman, a couple green glass, Van Winkles. No, <laughs> this place is incredible. Uh, every time I come here, you know, it this place excites me about the future of bourbon and everything going on in bourbon. They they really embrace it all and put it in a nice package. And I just love coming here. It's fun. Well, it's not only that. I mean, you've got you've got a what they're doing, the business model is revolutionary at the time, right? I mean, because you only had MGP as kind of like the big powerhouse. And then Bardstown Bourbon Company came in and kind of really disrupted a lot of the model that was happening. And the other side of this is that not only is just the whiskey, and now the whiskey is finally getting to the point where it's four years old, it's maturing, you're starting to see other brands start coming out with their whiskey from here, which is great. But then you have the other side of this, which is the, you know, the restaurant and everything that really gives Bardstown a new name. Like it's a place for somewhere to go. I know, you know, you growing up here, you probably would have loved to have something like this growing up. Oh, I mean, as soon as they built this place, we're like, am I in Bardstown? You know, it's like, uh, <laughs> never seen any place like this. I mean, I don't know what their mission statement is, but like it has something that has to be with hospitality. Cause every time we come here, it's like, I feel like, you know, I'm at home or like, they know me. They're like, Hey, come on and run. Let me take care of you. Let's do this. Let's do that. You know? And they're just so hospitable here. And it's such a great like user experience or, you know, a customer experience when you come here, not just us, but even if you're just coming on a tour, going to the restaurant, you know, checking out the facility facility. I mean, they just, they've nailed it here. Yeah. I think they do a really, really great job. I mean, it's, don't be wrong. Like, we go on a lot of barrel picks and we've done plenty of tours on our day. And sometimes you just feel like cattle in a herd. Right. And, like, and can you get through here? We got <laughs> next one. <laughs> and it, it truly does feel like that sometimes, but here it's a completely different experience. Uh, you do feel like it's a, it's a one-on-one -on -one operation. You know, you get to meet a lot of the people as well when you're going through and, and having those experiences. So can't say enough positive things about it. Yeah. But we before, let's quick give them a big head. Let's, let's kind of like, let's introduce <laughs> them and then maybe we'll take them down a few pegs. We'll do that. That's we'll right. Back. Okay. We got tough questions. Coming. <laughs> so today on the show, we have Nick Smith. Nick is the distillery manager and head distiller here at Bartstown Bourbon Company and Dan Calloway, the vice president of hospitality and product development. Fellas, welcome to the show. Great to be here. Thanks for having us. Yes. Thanks for having us. Happy to be here. Well, you know, Dan, I know that you said you've been a fan of the show for a while. Oh yeah, I feel like I'm in my in my car right now. This is uh, hearing your voices like this. Uh, you know, I, I make the trip down to Bardstown, and a lot of mornings I, I turn you guys on. So it's it's awesome to be a part of it. It's be weird when you hear your own voice on it at this time. It? Yeah, I'll be turning it up. <laughs> <laughs> I always turn it off when I talk. I can't stand it. <laughs> you know, and there's another thing that is is interesting about really what goes on here and the kind of dynamic of of even the hiring process because you know you're not from this area right you're commuting from louisville every day correct correct, correct. so is that a lot of the staff here that like you are you're bringing in a lot of like outside influence and it's just not all 100 percent bardstown native residents well that's that's an interesting question um part of that being the hospitality and building the restaurant and, and looking for people to come in um i think nick would tell you uh, the core of the distillery, that's 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 Bardstown through and through. Yes, the core of the distillery is Bardstown. Uh, you can tell from his accent, right? Yeah. Yes, <laughs> my accent. Uh, I asked him to give me a British accent, but uh, we're going to stick with the country accent yes. for today. Oh, so. Somebody else besides just me. <laughs> but with operations, uh, most people are local. I think uh, we do have a Southern Indiana is the, the farthest drive that we have. Um, but with that, very diverse. Uh, we have people from all over uh, Castle and Key, Jim Beam, Diageo, uh, Barton 1792. So most all of our operators, we have a very experienced team that came from all kinds of other distilleries. So, and not headhunted in any way. They wanted to come here to Barstown Bourbon Company. And it really makes for a better team because multiple distilleries do different things. So we got someone that's coming from every one of the places and they give their perspective on what can make it better. And with all the different distilleries, we get those ideas, and then we come up with the best idea to make our process as good as it could possibly be. What was the sales pitch to bring you both here? Because I'm sure you were happy in your previous life doing whatever. So I think it's just you, you take one foot in the building, you meet the team, uh, you meet the people behind it, and there's not much of a sales pitch needed once, once you see what this place is about. There was no sales pitch for me. I wanted to come here. So it wasn't that they wanted, we're coming after me and I'm a day one. So I've been here, one of the original hires. I've been here for over four years now. 
And uh, I was with Jim Beam Brands before, loved Jim Beam, worked at Claremont facility and the Booker No facility. But I saw this, like I'm Barchtown from Barchtown. So I was born and raised here as well. And like you said earlier, you see something like this coming up that this isn't normally for Barchtown. You know, I was used to just being able to go to Cracker Barrel was the nicest place I could go to eat in town. So, you know, exactly. when seeing this come up, very interesting, the business plan, I was really wanting to come. Um, the original distillery manager was my manager at Jim Beam. So getting to work with him initially and, and learn from him more, it, it, I just really wanted to be here. So talk about the original vision, I guess. And now that we're what, four to five years into it, how, what has been accomplished? What hasn't, how has it changed? Yeah. So that what, what we're about is, is what you touched on in the beginning, right? Combining distilling beverage and culinary into every aspect we do. So we call it the modern bourbon experience. It's a place where you can come out. Uh, we want you to spend the day. Come hang out, take a tour, do a cocktail class, a thieve out of a barrel, and then sit down, have a great meal, great cocktails, and really celebrate bourbon. I think you do all those pretty well around here. Yeah, yeah. Dan's been taking care of us for all five of those years. <laughs> <laughs> you know, the other thing that I forgot to mention is that there's a, there's a height requirement to be hired here too. Yeah, yeah. to get in the, well for this library to get the. Literally on the top shelf, you have to be, how tall are you, Dan? About 6'5". Yeah, you have to be 6'5". I five. used all of it and, about uh, 10 yeah, ago. I think he pulled a rib or something, you know, yeah. trying to get it. But <laughs> we're, we're the starting centers for our bachelor's <laughs> That's I would right. I think yeah. so. I, would, yeah, I, don't I was the starting center for mine, so, I, you know, shows how good we were. You know, <laughs> six-foot center, but... Uh, <laughs> yeah, and I actually didn't even notice it. Like, now we have a division in the table. Like, that side's Bardstown, this side's Louisville. I know. Finally, somebody else can say, you know, because everybody gives me crap because I say I'm from Bardstown all the time. Now, finally, someone else can can do it and, you know, take take some of the glory. Nick, you gotta, okay, school me here. Are banana croquettes a real thing? Yes. See, that's They what, are a real thing. <laughs> see, that's what There's, it's like. That is my grandfather's favorite thing, and I actually make them for Christmas every year for him. It, funny that you even asked it. Like, I don't cook. I don't do anything, and they're not nobody, fun to make. They're messy. Nobody gets these, you know, the, I tell them about banana croquettes. They think I'm, like, crazy, you know? It's explain, real. explain to our listeners who've never heard of banana croquettes before, because I know I've heard it before, and I'm just like, I what? mean, I'd be interested to see if our recipes are similar, but my, my grandmother's was just, you know, a banana Duke's mayo and then crushed up peanuts. That's all it is. Bingo. Yeah. Yeah. It's a banana. <laughs> I, and I like to take a little toothpick in them just to not be so messy. Banana, put a little mayo on it, and then just sprinkle peanuts on top. That's it. It sounds changing. disgusting, but it's actually very, very good. And it looks disgusting. <laughs> it looks disgusting as well. <laughs> but once you eat them, they're, they're special, I promise. Uh, coming to a BBC menu near you now. <laughs> <laughs> hey, it was on Top Chef. You know, Newman put them on there. No, that's true. That's true. I forgot about that. So I, I kind of want to like dive into a little bit of, you know, we, we kind of talked about your history. What were you doing also at Jim Beam when you were there? So I actually started at the ground level on Jim Beam. So straight out of college, University of Kentucky, got a degree in agriculture economics, could not find a job. So moved back home to Barchtown um, and distilling is everywhere. I mean, easiest, easiest job you could probably find. Knew the HR for Jim Beam, applied to every job they had, texted her and said, just give me an interview. That's all I'm asking for is an interview. And I started as a distillery relief operator. So I trained in every department of the distillery, water treatment, granary, dry house on the wet and dry side, boilers, coal and gas boilers, and then mashing and distilling. And I would cover the main operators off days, you know, 24 seven operations as big as they are. And so I worked swing shift on one week. I would work first, second and third shift. Uh, was not fun, but I was young, single, no kids, you know, no big deal. And then um, and I did that for three and a half years, learned a tremendous amount. And then I moved up to distillery supervisor and moved from the Claremont facility to the Booker No facility. Um, same process, but all new equipment, you know, had to relearn where everything was and a lot bigger facility. That one's the true workhorse putting out that Jim Beam white label like crazy and um, did that for a year and a half and then started here at Barstown Bourbon Company. Uh, it started on the ground level kind of here too. I was off shift distillery supervisor when I first started. And then I grew with the company. You talked about growth earlier, how how much we've grown. So been here just over four years. When we first started, we ran four days a week, uh, two 10-hour shifts, and we produced 1.5 million proof gallons a year. Eight months into it, we doubled capacity. Uh, added eight fermenters, went to 24-7 operations, and that took us to 3 million proof gallons a year. One year after that, we doubled capacity again, which involved adding another uh, mash cooker, another 36 inch column still. And then we built another fermenter house with 16 more fermenters, taking us to 6 million proof gallons a year. 
and then some efficiency projects changed our beer gallons. This year, we're looking at producing 7.3 million proof gallons, making us the seventh largest whiskey bourbon distillery in the U.S. So with that growth, I grew as well, going from an uh, off-shift supervisor here to senior supervisor to distillery manager, and now distillery manager and head distiller. So there's some data points there for you, isn't there? <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Yeah. So I mean, at Jim Beam, I'm sure they got a, a you know a system that's refined, you know, nailed down, and then you come here and you're like trying to create your own system, trying to grow. Talk about like some of the lessons that you learned going from something that's pretty much don't broke, don't fix it to like, we got, okay, we got to kind of reinvent the wheel and kind of make our own mark here. Yes, definitely a big change. Like you said, Jim Beam over 225 years of history, you know, everything set in place with their coming here. You know, at first I was thinking this could be a piece of cake. I'm working four days a week. <laughs> you know, I've got, I've got eight fermenter, train. eight fermenters, one mash cooker, like it, everything's in this one building. I don't have to walk, you know, a mile to get to the next, the next building. And um, it did not go that way. So, you know, fresh startups, you always have your growing pains, but ran very well. And the, but then the growth, I mean, it really just took off. And then the custom distillation, that's where I learned the most, which really got me to the head distiller point, because with Jim Beam, you know, I would run three, five mash bills. And that's most all the big guys you're, you're working with. Three to five mash bills is all they, all they do here. Now we're up to 50 mash bills. So I learned a tremendous amount about the different grains, different percentages, the the temperatures you're putting the grains in, um, and then working with other distillers with our customers, you know, working with Greg Snyder with Chicken Cock. I mean, a lot of distillers have been in it for many and many a years, getting that knowledge from them as well. So they're like, sit down, son, let me tell you what I want. <laughs> <laughs> you think you know, but <laughs> teach you how to run this machine right here. Yeah. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. They know. And, and they've done it. I mean, they, they've been around as Steve Nally, you know, our master distiller of 48 years in the industry. I pick that brain as often as I possibly can. So definitely have learned tremendous amount equipment changes. You know, like you said, uh, it, it startup went very well, but we had to change the equipment. You know, we just started there were some things that didn't work out, some just basic things that could cause little problems, but we've got it all lined out now and we're moving along real nice. So talk about that custom, you know, you're talking about custom mash bills and 50 different mash bills. Like, so, you know, say, I, well, and we are actually, but say we come to you with a, <laughs> you know, we got a, an idea, we got an idea, an idea or a mash on. bill and, you know, and we're like, walk us through that process because, you know, I'm sure there's somebody that's like, well, I got this mash bill. It's going to be great. And you're like, well, I don't know if that's going to work or, or are you just like, nope, we'll do it, whatever, you know? Oh, no, we're very transparent here and honest. We're not going to lead anybody down the wrong path. It, I mean, not to say we wouldn't want to take someone's money, but we wanted to come up with the best product we possibly can. And every customer is different. So some of them, they know the mash bill they want and they're not very hands-on. They'll send it and say, hey, we want to run a 75 corn 21 rye four percent malted barley and you all do your thing and then you have other customers that come in and very involved you know very new to the process don't know much about it and they want to create a mash bill so we'll lead them through a whole tasting we'll go over some wheats you know some rye bourbon some rye whiskeys try to figure out their portfolio worth what they like and then we'll narrow it down from there on the grain percentages and walk them through the entire process step by step and then like I said some like Greg Snyder with chicken cock. He comes in, he knows their mash bills. He'll come in for every single production on their first cooks and everything just to see how it's going. And, and he works with me, sit down on the set temperatures, control temperatures. So we work hand in hand together because I know how our equipment here runs, but he knows how he wants his bourbon to be made. So we work hand in hand for what we can do here and for what he wants to come up with the best project possible. Well, everybody gets a choice of what they want then. So I guess mm -hmm. that's, that's Have positive. it your way. Well, Nick, let's give you a break and, and let you take a minute here. Let's, let's jump on over here to Dan. So Dan, you know, we, we didn't really get into your background a little bit. So what brought you over to, to Bart's on Bourbon Company? Yeah. Uh, so my background is actually music, uh, interestingly enough. So I, I went to school for French horn, played in orchestras. I played down in New Orleans for a long time and then uh, a good bit in China and Japan and met my uh, current wife there in you, China. Wait, you played in China and Japan? Yeah, wow. yeah. We used to do a different city every night, you know, so we, we would play the show. It was always, it was uh, Hollywood music, film music, you know, they play the movie, then uh, have a dinner, go out. And I think that's, that was kind of the start of connecting with people that I, that I hadn't met before is, is I knew I would just see them for that night and, and have a great time, often over spirits. 
and I kind of fell in love with with the people more than than the music, to be honest. And I kind of saw that career path of of how could I apply that. So it's something I enjoy and, and something I love about coming to work here every day is meeting the team and then meeting people coming in. So so I met her you in sound China. The horn every morning. You know, yeah, like, everybody. <laughs> Hillary line startup. <laughs> yeah. Well, I met her and she was from Kentucky and and I had a background in wine. And I moved up to Louisville and then that just once you're in Kentucky, it, it all points to bourbon. So I uh, met Joe Heron, the founder of Copper and Kings, who was friends with the former CEO here who put me in touch and came down one time and that was it. Yeah. So. You know, I think the French horn's awesome. I was like, what if you had like some mystery, that. some yeah, mystery like guy. A basketball player to a French horn. <laughs> yeah. He's, he's well diverse. Like, I know. He's it, everywhere. It's so funny because there is so much commonality between music, like perfecting an art, and then on the product development side, how you think about whiskey, you know, people coming together to create something that's that's separate from themselves and just kind of aspire to make something great. And, and uh, you know, a lot of practice goes into both of them. So it was a natural transition. Yeah. And we talked about in the beginning, you know, how hospitable you know, this place is, how much were you involved in creating that environment or was that their vision or? Yeah. So I initially came down, you know, like Nick, Nick touched on the expansion here has just been tremendous. You know, initially it was just going to be kind of a cafe with a, with a bar came down to start that bar. So I initially started, uh, as bourbon education and beverage director, right? So, uh, thinking about how we were going to teach people about our bourbon, built the bar, then the restaurant opened. And then from there, the visitor's side. So I kind of opened each piece and now oversee the front-facing operations, the, the tours in the restaurant, and then also heading up the product development, thinking about what products we're going to come out with next. And I guess that kind of leads into how do you two work hand-in-hand hand with distilling and product manage, or product development and stuff like that? Kind of, kind of talk about that relationship. Yeah, it's a great one. And it's, it's something unique to us. And it's something that's happened really since day one. Is So we do a lot of blends, right? And Initially, our fusion blend, which uh, you guys have had, it's, we've had a lot of success with. It's a way we incorporate our young bourbon with, with older bourbon, release uh, product that's coming off our still. We, we don't have a master blender on site, right? So we put together Steve Nally, Nick Smith, John Hargrove, these great distillery minds with our, our culinary team, uh, executive chef Stu Plush, and then our cocktail experts like our national brand ambassador, Sam Montgomery. We all get in a room, it's about 15 people, and we do it like an NCA Final Four bracket. We line up all these blends we submit because we have you know over fifty mash bills, so we have all these options. We all get in the room. We we have these blends we we personally have submitted, and and we blind taste everything. We're huge on blind tasting. So you start off with you know fifty to sixty options of what a product can be, and we we vote, we talk about it, and we narrow it down. It's almost unanimous every time with the winner, and and that's how we release our blends. So I like that idea because a lot yeah. of I know. I hear a lot of complaints out of folks in the distilling side. They're like, those damn marketing people, like, can't they just leave me alone? And, you know, and vice versa, you know, like, can't the distillers get more creative and do this and that? You know, I like how it's a collaboration. So you kind of get, and it's blind. So there's no like bias yeah. or anything. And it, it's a product of being under one roof, right? So we all work right next to each other. You know, I can walk down to Nick's office and, and just right through the still. So we're always talking about ideas um and what bourbon can be and we all think about it differently and it, it just creates a beautiful thing and it, i like how it gets everyone involved so it, and it's not just the executive team or, or the high ups that submit blends anyone in the company is able to submit a blend so um we've had some of our our executive uh tour guides that, that have submitted blends in one our fusion four i believe yeah. one of our tour guides came up with that blend and then discovery four executive chefs do did that blend so it's not just the distillers or or the blenders that, that went out every time, it, it's a collective team and it gets everyone involved and excited about the next product that's coming out. And what I love most, we touch a lot of palettes with it. So we're getting a collective average of the best product instead of just one, you know, Dan's palette could be completely different than my palette. What he thinks is excellent, I might not think is excellent. So we're touching a lot of them and we're getting the best product we can possibly come out with by the team instead of just by one individual. So do you get a plaque out on the moss wall? You know, if I was going to say that or is like discovery four is mine. You get because he said final four. I was like, is there like a ceremonial like cutting of the nets or something like that? Somebody gets to do. Yeah. You get to make the hang tag. Yeah. So oh. you're you're, you're oh. on the hang tag. You're, you're all I over. That, Everybody right. that gets a bottle gets to see you. So that, that that's that's a little 
little perk of it. I don't even make our hang tags. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe we should do hang tags, right? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and so I guess kind of talk about, you know, so you have 50 mash bills and if somebody's going to submit something, like, where do you begin? Like, do they have a baseline? Is there, is there like, oh, we've got this room, just have just at catalog. it. Like, yeah, yeah. Like what, what's the, what's the process? It, it's, they, they usually have a baseline. I, like I said, ones that do not, that's why we go through the tasting. What, what is it that they're looking for? What do they like? What is their preference? Are they a wheat favorite? Do they like rye? Do they want a whiskey or do they want a bourbon? You know, and, and lead them through that tasting to see what, what it is that they're really wanting. What finished products are they, are they, are popular that they like, you know, what, what do you like to go to? What are you wanting to come out with? And we can try to do something comparable to that. And then other ones with say like specialty grains, you know, we, we've done a popcorn, uh, Wait, what? Start popcorn. over, start over. <laughs> okay. Go on. So, so we've, we've done a popcorn bourbon, which is, um, a black popcorn. And we've also done a red, white, and blue popcorn. And, you know, no one had done popcorn came to us and is it possible? Well, if, you got starch, it's possible. You starch to sugar, sugar to alcohol. So, you know, we, we get samples of that grain, send it out for testing to make sure that it does have the starch content and things that you need to be able to convert it over to alcohol. It was all good. We, we did a trial for it. So sometimes doing an experimental one before you do a whole production run to make sure it is going to come out all right. Everything was fabulous. And actually with that black popcorn, it made a purple mash. Really neat to see because, you no, know, normally when you're That's looking cool. at the fermenters, you kind of got that brown mash. This one was completely purple. Really, really neat to see. That would be really in the hypnotic. story when you're walking <laughs> through all brown mash. You know everything's looking normal. Boom, purple. Like what? What happened here? But um, and you were thinking like, oh shit, how are we gonna clean this afterwards? <laughs> <laughs> no, nothing like that. So, but um, and, and that's just that's how we work with them. We wanted to come up with the best product possible for them. So and a bunch of like artificial like movie movie popcorn butter like floating in there too something like that yeah. and see so they they own a popcorn company so they grow all the seed and everything themselves so it was all their grain that that was used they bring that grain in here and and then other customers that might want to use a different specialty grain we can source that as well or we can i've got a customer in arkansas and he wanted his to be as similar as possible to the product that he's producing down in arkansas well, what we run in one day takes him two years. So, you know, he comes up and we used all of his Arkansas corn, Arkansas wheat, all the grains that he uses, we source from that exact same place. So follow his mash bill, his yeast strain, everything like that. So we want to make product that's going to make them happy and the highest quality possible. I got a question about you're pulling from the 50 mash bills for your own blend or whatever are, is there any like exclusivity like say if i want to match i'll be like you cannot use it for any of your brands or do y'all kind of how does that work not so much uh it's it's wide open so I'll, I'll put out a list of what's available i got you and then the capacity but we really try not to put too many limitations on it because we want the flavor to be the driver so we don't talk about the proof uh or or percentages it's just go let's make the best bourbon we can and then go from there and figure out what it's going to be so it's, it's something we'll continue to do, even as our bourbon comes out. So we started distilling in 2016, as Nick said. Our 100% estate distilled, we're targeting 2023. But even when we come out with that Bardstown bourbon, Bardstown rye, we're still going to be doing blends. This art of blending something we feel like we're on the forefront of, um, and we'll continue to do that and finishing. We, have, you know, we do an incredible job, I think, of, of making finished bourbons uh, with some awesome collaborative partners some of you guys might have had yeah know. the Ar the Mar armagnac ones like one of my oh favorites. yeah the, good the lord that? Is, that a bar, is that a bar same way of saying yeah armagnac? <laughs> how do you spell that armagnac what maybe? language is that yeah yeah so that's something that we love doing and, and it's it's celebrating an, another company we're excited about so we have some big uh big ones on deck aging currently a, a nice founder's stout we're doing the chateau de la Baud armagnac again which will be a big hit he says it much more eloquently. he does doesn't he <laughs> It's the bards down in us, Nick. Try to see if Nick can say it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so it's cool. Those are things we'll continue to do, even when our core products come out. So yeah, I know, and you did uh, well, like Pfeiffer Pavit Reserve or something yes. like that. Wine mm -hmm. finish. So that's yes. something special. That actually won uh, San Francisco Best in Class Finished Bourbon. So uh, Suzanne Pfeiffer Pavit, great Napa winery. We're taking uh, aged the the first go around. It was eight year bourbon finished for 18 months and then the second release is going to be a 10-year bourbon with the same finish and then we have something very special 
for those of you that have been here, you know, we just installed a fill your own bottle out in our Rick House. We have a great Rick House speakeasy lounge, and we have some of the original uh, best in class finished bourbon that's been aging for 40 months now. So it's going to be the Pfeiffer Pavit XO finish. It's going to be a great way to kick off uh, these special on site distillery only releases that are coming soon. I know what we're doing after this. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> Get your bottles ready. Sounds <laughs> great. Yeah. So, I mean, th- that was one thing we, you know, we talked about the, uh, the finishing, we talked about distilling. I guess one of the things that we need also to think about is, you know, if you do talk to a customer, there's a, a very important part of this. I know Ryan had talked about, you know, can we make sure that a, a mash bill is only particular to us? But we all know that like what 60, 70, 80% of the flavor comes from the barrel. How do you guide customers to say, this is, these are the people that you want to go to. Is it this barrel manufacturer? Or do you say like you go source on your own? Like how, how does that process work? It, it's same as kind of the distilling process. It's um, some of them know who they want to go with when they come in. We've used nine different cooperages since we've been here. So we, we know which ones ha- have worked really well, which ones have not. And, and we promote certain ones and we have great relationships with certain ones. Um, some, if they're dead set on who they want to use, that's who we go with. It's their product. We want to make the best product possible. Like I said, quality is everything for us on, and making sure that the customer is happy. So with that, we, we've used Independent Stave Company, uh, Canton Cooperage, Kelvin, Speyside, Barrel 53, uh, a new cooper on the scene, a West Virginia Great Barrel Company. They're, they're really going to change the game, I think, and as far as making a barrel. A lot of technology, robotics, automation in their plant. Uh, I visited about two, three months ago, I was able to make a visit out there and really, really neat to see, uh, you go in the facility, no sawdust. It feels like it does in here. Wow. It's quiet. <laughs> uh, and, and like I said, they have the, the infrared technology and robotics that makes almost a perfect barrel every single time. So it, it, the, the cooperage industry is definitely changing as far as the automation goes. And they do a great job with that. Uh, independent stave company is definitely the, the largest, you know, the biggest cooper out there. And that's who we use more than anyone else, uh, and especially right down the road in Lebanon. You know, the, it takes 20 minutes to be able to get a load of barrels over here to us. So that's who we use more often than not, but it's up to the customer on who they want to use. And, and we'll go over char levels with them. You know, do they want a toasted barrel? Do they want a char three, a char four? Well, you know, what, what do they want? And we'll guide them for what's the best direction to go for the mash bill that you have. Yeah. I mean, like on a popcorn bourbon, like where do you, where do you take something like that? With, with the popcorn bourbon, you know, we, we went with, I believe he went independent stave company, char number three. You know, that's your traditional type barrel. You know, your char three, char three, char four, your traditional type barrel. Yeah. And like you said, 60 per 70 percent of that flavor is going to come from that barrel. So the barrel is very important in the, in the process. Yeah, absolutely. And then, Dan, does anybody come here and like need guidance, I guess, like with marketing, packaging? Spirits of French Lick exploded onto the distilling scene early in 2016 as Indiana's largest double pot still distillery. They employ old world sentiment with new world attitudes, delivering the finest handcrafted bottle and bond bourbons to an audience eager for an alternative to the big guys. And their distiller, Alan Bishop, uses historic Hoosier yeast strains, alternative grains, and 53 gallon number two char barrels to bring you spirits with unparalleled quality and depth of flavor. You can find all spirits of French Licks products and new releases on sealbox.com. But don't just take Fred Minnick's word for it. Find out for yourself. Check out spiritsoffrenchlick.com and follow them on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter. And remember, always drink responsibly. So I've got to admit, I'm sort of a honey addict. I use it for dipping chicken tenders. I combine it with some cured meats on a nice charcuterie board. And I mix it with my bourbon cocktails when making hot toddies or a gold rush. But lately, I've been enjoying all that with a little bit of a kick. And Fire Bee Honey is your go-to for spice. Fire Bee Spicy Honey is all natural and can pair with almost anything. Fire Bee opens up a whole new world of sweetness with no added sugars. You can enjoy flavors such as elderberry, vanilla, cinnamon, and chocolate as it comes alive. Fire Bee is offering a special promotion for Bourbon Pursuit listeners. Get 15% off your purchase when you order two or more bottles by using the link at firebeehoney.com slash bourbon pursuit. That's firebeehoney.com slash bourbon pursuit for 15% off your purchase of two or more bottles. It's time to fling into spring at Total Wine and more, where fresh flavors are in full bloom and we're talking bubbly and brunch with Pinot on the porch. 
So no matter what's on your table, they have the wine and the savings to match. Bacon practically begs for Chardonnay. And which rosé are you feeling today? They surely have your shade. Brighten up your glass with a fresh bourbon cocktail. Mint julep or a Belmont jewel, anyone? And with over 8,000 wines, 4,000 spirits, and 2,500 beers to choose from, you can expect the unexpected. And always at low prices with the best service in America. So what will it be today? Choose curbside pickup or in-store pickup. You can explore more in the store or online at TotalWine.com. Dan, does anybody come here and like need guidance, I guess, like with marketing, packaging and, you know, help, do you all got you guys help with that? In Great regard? question, Ryan. Absolutely. Yeah. So we have an incredible uh, design team. You know, you can, you can see on our bottles, it's something special. Um, we, we are, are raving about these corks. No, oh yeah. Awesome. <laughs> Gold cork. It's a pound, it's a pound just for that. <laughs> yeah. So we've got a great powerhouse, uh, team, Herb Hanneman, uh, heads up our sales and marketing. Then, uh, Laura Laltman, who's our marketing director. And then Michael Powell, our creative director, the three of them, uh, do a lot of that for, for other companies and they, they make some pretty special designs. And it's not just the marketing. We're moving over to bottling coming forward as well so uh, on your all's drive in i'm sure you saw the big building construction oh, yeah. going up out there that'll be our bottling facility so that's supposed to be ready on june 1st of next year and we're already assisting some of our customers who are going to be ready to bottle with all of those components as well you know what what bottle design and as he said label design your cola approvals compliance we have compliance here as well to make oh, sure gosh. that everything don't, don't start everything is paperwork. legal you know because oh, you know brand brand new releases you have a compliance that, department we're in <laughs> <laughs> that's the important thing i mean it, you got to cover cover everything to make sure you're doing it right to the highest level and and legal so like i said the bottling is going to be huge that would make us pretty much a one-stop shop for any of our customers you're able to come in custom to steel. We have the warehouses you're able to store, and then we'll have the bottling to be able to finish your product and, and send it out. And then at the end, we have retail and we celebrate all of our customers in there as well to be able to sell their bottles as, along with ours in our retail shop. Yeah. I mean, I, I think we, we need to give the compliance thing a little bit more, more touch because, you know, when we've been doing our own stuff, it is a pain because you got to deal with every single state. You got to deal with the registering. There's states that you have to actually submit forms every single month if you actually sell any product to that particular state. Like it's a pain Even to be able to do all. If you don't sell something that month, yeah, and if you don't <laughs> sell anything, you still have to submit a form that says zero dollars on it. And then you submit it, and they're like, "Uh," and it's been four months, and they're like, "Yeah, we're still working on stuff six months ago." <laughs> you know, and you're like, "Okay, hurry up and wait," I guess. No, oh, this yeah, the legal system on it is just it's a whole other beast there. So what about I guess. You talk about covering all facets. What about, you know, you, you have the gift shop where you can sell an array of things. What if somebody is like, I want to go see where chicken cocks made or, you know, can, can would this be the tourist destination, you know, for pursuit spirits or, Absolutely. you know, chicken cock or wherever? You know, if you, when you walk by our bar, you'll see every brand, you know, we want to be that core, uh, you know, celebrating not just our stuff, but all of Bardstown, all of Kentucky. Um, we've hosted tasting events for other companies. We did... Max Shapiro's 80th birthday, Heaven Hill. You know, the team from Willett will be in here uh, having lunch. We, re we really just want to be neutral territory. Of course, you can do your release here. You should. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Why not? Absolutely. Put it on the list. Put it on the list. So the other thing, you know, we, we kind of talked about a little bit this discovery series. What Kind of talk a little bit more about that, that goes into, you know, especially like this release that we've, we've got here. That's a, that's a special one. So this has not come out yet. It's actually coming out tomorrow in our gift shop. This is our oh. discovery series. Looks like a lot of people have been drinking. It. Yeah, <laughs> well. And if you're listening to this now, it was, <laughs> research it was yesterday or a few weeks ago. Yeah. Quality control. Yeah. yeah. So discovery is all about that art of blending, right? Taking a, a group of bourbons or whiskeys and, and making a product that's better than any of the individual parts. Something you see in champagne, you see in scotch, you see in tea, not so much bourbon, you know? Um, and we want to be on the forefront of that blending because of that approach we use. So this is discovery series number four. It's a blend of 10 year, 13 year and 15 year Kentucky bourbons. And it's our wow. chef, Stu Plush, our executive chef. He put this blend together. It's something special. 115 proof, got a nice kick to it. It sure does. But it's got a lot of, uh, you know, depth, richness, complexity from that age. Mm -hmm. It really does. It's actually really, maybe it's just the first drink of the day, but damn, it's good. Gosh, I yeah. know. It's like, I want more. <laughs> Go, bottles right there. 
<laughs> well, free. Yeah. You guys just leave a room real quick. You're going to start seeing a lot of these bottles start getting just a little bit lower and lower. Yeah. So this room we, we didn't touch on. So one of the things we really pride ourselves on is these immersive tour experiences. We took every tour on the trail, respect them, but we wanted to be something different, you know? So we, we take a hands-on approach right out of the gate. We taste distillate mature it then we go into blends then we we go right into the rick house thieve right out of the barrel we do cocktail classes we we really want you to dive in and, and touch taste feel the spirit and avoid kind of that like you said being cattle or a lecture tour you know <laughs> the, uh <laughs> the 51 percent tour right yeah. exactly so yeah. uh it kind of has that like napa vibe here you know yeah, where it's that like, napification i've been to you know wineries that out there and the, you know there are those factory tours and you're just like oh that's kind of whereas the other ones where they like talk to you and do cocktail or do i mean you don't do cocktails with wine but you're like you sit there and <laughs> you know have listen to a guitar player maybe a french horn you know yeah, you yeah. get your french horn around it but uh no those are definitely the most memorable experiences you exactly. should start every tour with a french horn i know it's like a, just like a good 30 second intro be like welcome to parts yeah. and company <laughs> <laughs> try it um but yeah this 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 room is part of part of that experience right so this is our vintage whiskey library it's our newest room it's over 400 bottles uh dating back to 1892 and they're all available by the poor which is pretty pretty awesome uh as you guys know fred put together a lot of this and then the other half being bill thomas of the jack rose they both have a lot of whiskey yes yeah. they do <laughs> they can they can let some of it go no i mean it's it's awesome i mean this is just one of those rooms that you come in and you just get lost i mean you get lost in just the history jealousy i guess like a little bit of everything right? that was the first thing that came up <laughs> <laughs> jealousy yeah and thirsty yeah i mean there's just a lot of things that are in here that you a lot of people just never get the opportunity to be able to do and you know i think there's probably what this and jack rose like how many other places have this deep of a library that you could actually go and sample from and the fact that it's here on the bourbon trail you know you can stop here for a lunch get yourself a vintage pour you know hear a french horn like it has yeah. everything it has all the the <laughs> trifecta of, of everything going on there that is the bourbon trifecta right? <laughs> <laughs> no, and the and prices are reasonable too uh hell i think i've drank probably an, a whole bottle of 1988 old granddad here yeah i remember <laughs> <laughs> they probably had to raise the prices because yeah i know <laughs> no that's we wanted it to be approachable like everything we do in our restaurant right we didn't it I think napification is a great way to describe it, right? But we still want to be approachable. We still want to serve the town of Bardstown. So you can come in, um, have a reasonable lunch, you know, made by an incredible chef, but it's somewhere you can celebrate. You can have multiple cocktails. You can you can have a great dinner and, and it's it's at a reasonable price, right? We want to always be approachable. I remember at first when they had these great ahi tuna tacos, but first I was like, ahi tuna in Bardstown. Oh no. <laughs> <laughs> like, but they, they're excellent. They were yeah. one of my favorite things. And these chessmen, I think these are $30, $40 a pour. So you can taste some of the best bourbon ever made uh, right here on site. Fantastic. Now, I guess the next question people are going to ask is, what is the most expensive pour that you can get out of here? Uh, right there, the Gold Wax Van Winkle. Well, uh, Glad we got one. Yeah. <laughs> while we were setting up. <laughs> yeah, that's uh, 2,500 an ounce on that one. So, Have you, uh, we were talking before the show, uh, have you done a rough calculation by the pour? What's in value in this room? Yeah, it's... It, Not to entice someone to break in here, but... Yeah, we need to up our lock a little bit. It's, <laughs> yeah. uh, it's north of a million right now by the pour, yeah. Yeah, they probably got a little bit something better than ring security cameras hanging around, right? It, right up above us. So whenever we get out of here, I'm going to oh, go back and look oh, at yeah, the footage and send, <laughs> send you guys a bill for every bottle that you picked <laughs> I don't up know. when, I when thought, we weren't in here. I thought maybe we had easy, because we couldn't find an outlet in here. I was like, maybe they don't have cameras. <laughs> <laughs> Sneak a pour. Yeah. No, I would never do that. Yeah, it was funny. It didn't, didn't nobody saw the setup portion here. We were actually trying to set up and we were like, where, where can we plug into? They're like, you know what? It's funny. We actually didn't build an outlet in here when we were doing it. <laughs> it's so, a vintage experience. Yeah, it really yeah, right. is. It really is. You got to hand crank your own electricity if you want something. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> and so what's the uh, what's the timeline on looking when the bottling hall is going to be done over there and, and what's that going to look like as a part of like the visitor experience too so the timeline on that is looking on june 1st it should be complete we should be up and uh, up and running hopefully maybe a few weeks before and we'll do some test runs and everything on some of our products but as far as for our customers we're hoping june 1st of next year will be up and running Fifty thousand square foot facility um, Justin Willett has been the one leading this project. He's actually the executive director of manufacturing operations here. So my boss and uh, he, excellent what he does. He's been in the industry a long time. He was Heaven Hill, Barton 1792. 
He was the plant engineer at Barton 1792, and he knows bottling in and out. So I'm actually going to learn a whole lot from him when the bottling does start up because I haven't been around bottling as much. You know, I usually stick to the distillery, so I'm going to learn as much as I can while while I have his knowledge to be able to pick from. So we'll have multiple lines. Um, and, and like I said, it'll it'll follow the same philosophy as our distillation program. It'll be custom bottling as well. So they, they're able to help with the bottle designs, label designs, uh, sourcing the product, you know, the vendors, best vendors to go to, uh, pricing, everything like that. So it'll be, once again, a, a custom setup. And then as far as tourism goes. Well, here, before we get to tourism real quick, because I, I had an interesting kind of take on on bottling that I didn't really know about until I really got to get into this industry, is that a lot of bottling manufacturing equipment is actually in Italy. Like, I had no idea. Like, are you all actually getting equipment from Italy or is it somewhere sourced like anywhere else? Like, I know they have some a lot locally sourced. So I know a lot of U.S. bottler equipment is stuff that they're going with. So as far as all the big equipment, that'd be a Justin Willis <laughs> question, definitely. He's like, but, I'm the distiller. Well, but the, they I'm are the they <laughs> are going. Don't ask I that. do know <laughs> on, on their fillers and stuff like that, they're they're going down to um, Georgia next week to, to test one of the pieces of equipment down there. So we do have some that's not from Italy, but I'm sure some is coming from overseas. But they're they're already starting to go in and test all of it out, and it'll be here before we know it. You, like you, when you pulled in, you saw the sides are already on the building. It, it's moving along real good. As long as we can have a nice winter and no bad weather, we should be hitting the date no problem. Well, you say no bad weather. It's really weird. Like last year, I don't think we had any snow whatsoever. It, no. it was, and I think that's it's interesting when you think about barrel characteristics and how barrels are going to age. I mean, you know, one year could be different, but it's just like what do we claim here in Kentucky? We're like, oh, really cold winters, really hot summers. And we're like, eh, we had really hot summer. Then we had a very mild winter. Who knows what that's going to do to whiskey and, you know. It was a mild uh, winter, but we also had drastic temperature changes. I mean, so it was a mild winter, but we had, you know, days that it was kind of maybe 70 degrees during the day, but it got down to the 20s at night. So you're getting that expansion contraction in that barrel with that temperature change like that but no the the winter we had last year was a uh, very mild you could say mm -hmm. yeah it killed my kid because we went out and we actually bought sleds in the beginning of the year because if you try to go buy a sled oh, yeah. when it snows they's gone so it's, like, it's your fault yeah pretty much. <laughs> you jinxed yeah. Us. so yeah we totally like jinxed the whole process of it yeah, I still have to use trash can lens because I never like <laughs> buy in advance and we're like, oh, no sleds out there. Let's, let's go, kids. As soon, as soon as the first snow hits, you go to Costco and you're like, oh, they're all sold out. I knew this was going to happen. It's a barge town thing. It is. On the yeah, tra we trash like trash can, can lids. lids yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Lube them up like Chevy Chase, you know. And, uh, but uh, no, I mean, that's awesome. The bottling, because that's got to give customers a lot of peace of mind. That's like a one stop shop because there's, you know, there's so many especially when you're sourcing or having contract distillation, there's so many moving parts, you know, then you're trying to like coordinate between this bottler that, you know, it's nice to have it all under one roof. Yes. And, and third party bottling, you know, it, it's, it's tough to find a place that has a good quality bottling, you know, and, and then you want to be there the entire time to make sure that your product's getting done. I mean, this is the finished product we're talking about, you know, this is what the consumers are going to have in their hands. And you want it to be top notch, top quality. So you have to be there the entire process to make sure that they're doing your process right if you're not feeling real good about it. And with ours, it'll be just like our custom distillation, top notch. Quality is going to be the main thing. The, the customers will be able to trust that their product is getting done correctly at the best way possible. So kind of talk about what, if there are plans to you know, have that be a part of the visitor experience, because I know that it's one of those things. I mean, we've been to Heaven Hill. And you go and you see their bottling and it's, you're just like, holy crap. Like there's, yeah, there's not a person touching a bottle here, except it looks that, like that a one word or Amazon factory. Yeah. You know, it's, yeah. I mean, it's, it's, and it's really cool to see, you know, automation at work and, and really kind of just be kind of taken in just by, you know, as mentioned before, like robotics and stuff like mm -hmm. that. So kind of talk about what you all plan on integrating that as a part of the experience. Yeah. I, th I think it will integrate, um, on, on the core tour. What it won't be though is y there's a beautiful overhang where you where you can view it. It's not just going to be hey, there's bottling, you know. Uh, <laughs> that's, that's, which is, that's the four roses experience. <laughs> right, like, here's right. our here's our bottling. You're like, all right, right. They <laughs> so, may or may not be on lunch. So. Yeah. <laughs> with with everything we do, we want a creative, modern, different approach to it, right? So we're going to be thoughtful about it. I'm going to think about a way that we can engage uh, the guest with bottling, and it's not just a 
a walk by. So yes, it will it will be involved and it will be different and remains to be seen. And one of the big things for the customers and you all as well is the quality that we're going to have, quality labs that we're going to have over in bottling is going to be one heck of a lab over there. So it's not just going to be for testing, but we're also going to have a full century lab, tasting lab, everything to be able to bring your products in, do the blendings, everything in there. It'll be a whole lab totally for century quality testing, everything like that with the customer. So blends, all that will be done over in our bottling facility going forward. There's going to be a lot yeah. the door. Yeah, I remember when we first came and started working with y'all and you you're like, let's go to the lab and start working. I was like, a lab? <laughs> the, and then they're like, you can use this whenever you want. And I was like, really? I'm like, I'm using my desk and the beakers at home. You know, this is great. Some plastic pipettes and everything. <laughs> yeah, yeah exactly. I know. And this lab will be even better than the one you all went to in the distillery. So like I said, it'll be set up for Century for doing blends for everything like that. So it'll be top notch. Then they come in and be like, Nick, come over here. What do you think of this one? You know, get your, pick your brain, right? That's mm-hmm. the best part of the job. Yep, get, get exactly. to, getting a drink and try things. <laughs> yep. I mean, and speaking of of just, you know, being able to like get away and have a drink and all that sort of stuff as well, you know, how much of the distillery process is, is kind of on, you know, a, you know, an automation schedule, if you will, where you can kind of look at it and you kind of see things are, are, are functioning, they're working as they should versus like sitting there. You know, like where you're a DJ, like turning knobs all the time or something like that. So, so we have a lot of technology, probably the most technologically advanced distillery out there. Um, we use a process, uh, HMI through ignition. So ignition, we're the first distillery to fully implement ignition. Uh, it, it's used at Sierra Nevada. It's used at Walmart. Uh, I think Hershey's is implemented as well. So a lot of big companies use, use this technology and that's what, um, all of our operators use on their HMI screens. So we don't want to be fully automated because I, I like my operators to be involved with the process, but they're not turning knobs and doing stuff like that, but they are hands-on involved. So if they go to pump a cookout or, or drop a fermenter, all of those are manual valves down below that they do have to go open up. I don't like them to just want to be sitting in a air conditioned room and hitting a start <laughs> button and then just sitting back and Dan's watching bringing them an old fashioned yeah. Yeah. <laughs> just sit back and watching to make make sure that the technology is running the full process they're actually involved so we have a lot of technology with it i can load up the the full procedure in there but they actually have to manually go through those steps it's not just hitting a start button they have to enter the temperatures they want to go to when they hit that enter the temperature and hit the start button yes it will go up to that temperature but it'll cut off at that temperature for them and then they'll go to the next step in their process they're not just hitting the start button and it's going all the way through the entire process to the end they have to still physically do each and every step and the main reason for that is all the changeovers that we do have we have this year i think right now i'm looking at 104 changeovers in the distillery 104 Explain what it yeah, changeover yeah, is. So that's going from so a different mash bill, different customer. So if I'm going, you know, from a rye bourbon to a, to a wheat bourbon to a wheat whiskey to a rye whiskey, to so, popcorn, yeah, to a pop- <laughs> so changing grains, changing mash bills, changing percentages like that would be a different or customers as well. So you know, we we've ran seven different mash bills in one week before, so it, it's not an uncommon thing. And looking at just Q4, I think had 33 different changeovers in just this quarter. So wow. it, it's been uh, it, musical silos on the granary sometimes, <laughs> but it, it's it's good to have them hands on with it instead of just letting technology run all of it. Musical silos. Have you trademarked that one yet? <laughs> That's pretty good. I'll Not like yet, but I mean, it's got to be difficult. Also, when you think of a lot of different distilleries out there, they're like, oh yes, sour mash. We got to have back set, and this is what we do to get consistency. And I mean, what is that the, that changeover process where you're trying to figure out like, okay, do we leave some back set in here? Do we so that goes with, uh, you know, the customer, what they want. So typically I don't try to do like a, a rye bourbon uh, back set going into a, a wheat bourbon. Usually I would clean out and I'm going to do a, a sweet mash, a water mash until I start distilling, you know, the wheat. And then I'll start doing sour mash back into the wheat cook. So I try to keep the grains the same. Um but I, I prefer to do the sour mash over the sweet mash, but it's also customer dependent and it matters the mash bill I'm running if I do a sour mash or a sweet mash. So, you know, a lot of my rye whiskeys, I like to do water mashes on those instead of sour mashes. So it's different for each recipe that I run. 
All right, you got to say what a water mash is now, because now we're now we're learning a territory that I don't even know about. Well, that's a sweet mash, water mash. That's that's not you doing any Dark back from set. fresh. Yeah, okay. so that, that's just doing all water and not putting any of your thin slopper back set back into the cook. Dan so. came up with that name for marketing. Yeah, that's mm-hmm. you made the water mash first. <laughs> your, your sweet mash is going to be all water, so that's your water mash. Yep. There we go. We're learning new things. You know, and Dan, I want to bring you into this a little bit too before we kind of close this out because there's something that is new here that we've been able to go and see a few times now, and that's Pete's place. Yeah, incredible. And we should touch on our founder, Pete Lofton, just an incredible man. Uh, started a telecommunications company, you know, was a billionaire at 28 out of Raleigh, North Carolina. Got into bourbon, was sourcing barrels through MGP, and realized that there was a need, there was a demand for this, this custom distillation. And he saw that it was a more difficult process than it, than it should be. So he decided to do it himself and had the vision to build this place and recruit an amazing team. Unfortunately, passed away uh, about a year ago. And the last thing he was working on was his Pete's Place, which is a speakeasy bar, uh, called tasting room, uh, attached to Rick House A. So you can do your single barrel pick, you're standing, you're surrounded by barrels, and then you walk through uh, he also used to own the Versace mansion. So there's touches of that in that. I had no in, idea. Yeah. He also really wanted a large bar stool. He, he said he was never comfortable in any bar stools. So that's why they're nice around. And uh, it's it's a place, it just goes with the whole essence of, of Barstown Bourbon Company, a place to celebrate bourbon, connect with people. So we run our cocktail classes. You can rent it out uh, for a private event, bachelor party, watch a sports game. Um, just a really special room. Yeah, it is. It's really cool. Yeah. And you got that like fishbowl effect where you, you know, you got these large glass walls that you can see inside the rec house and you can be inside the bar at the same exact time. So if you think the vintage library is cool, if you're watching this on video, you should probably go check out Pete's place too. Yeah, it's nice because you don't have to either like sweat like crazy or freeze your ass off. You, know, in the rec <laughs> yeah. house. you can do your barrel pick out there and look at the rec house. It's, it's a nice, cozy uh, place. Absolutely. Go thieve it and then run back into, the, uh, <laughs> run back into Pete's place. Done that a few times. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So the other thing I kind of want to bring up is the idea of Kentucky Proud. Can you kind of explain what, what you're trying to do as a part of that? Yes. Yeah, so that was a, an idea I had that I wanted to do something locally to give kind of back to the community. You always hear about Kentucky bourbon, but how often do you hear that actually everything that went into it came from Kentucky? You know, you have your your barley that's not typically grown around here. The, the malted is not usually malted here. Some of the white oak might not come from Kentucky. You know, you could be getting it from Missouri, other places, your raw materials. So I wanted to do something that gave back to the community and was all Kentucky. So I partnered with Kentucky Proud. It'll be a certified Kentucky Proud product. And I want to do a different mash bill each year. And the first one I did, it's going to be a wheat whiskey. So with that, I sourced the, the wheat locally, the corn locally. I had barley grown in Southern Kentucky and malted in Cynthiana, Kentucky by South Fork Malt House. And then I had all the wood from uh, Kentucky White Oak and Canton Cooperage in Lebden did all the barrels. So every raw material, every facet of that mash bill will be all done Kentucky. And then, of course, mashed in Kentucky, distilled Kentucky, stored Kentucky. Bottled in Kentucky. So. Sold in Kentucky. <laughs> sold or in be everywhere else. <laughs> it will be a Kentucky only sold product. So there it just go. will there be Kentucky. So it's, it's funny because anybody that's not from Kentucky, you actually go to like a grocery store and you see the, like oh, a yeah. small I sticker that's, that's say, like yeah. about the size of your thumbnail. It says Kentucky Proud on it. So mm-hmm. you can put that on the bottle too, I guess, if you that, want to. I, I plan on it. It's actually on every barrel. So oh. all, all the barrels are laser. Is the size of your thumbnail too? It's or? bigger than the thumbnail. <laughs> so all the barrels are laser engraved and it actually has the Kentucky Proud logo on the barrels. And I plan on putting it on the bottle as well. So we'll it, their own hang tag, you know. Yeah. It'll be awesome. That's awesome. Well, appreciate mm-hmm. it. And guys, thank you again for coming on the show today because I think we learned way more about Bar- Barstown Bourbon Company, especially for our listeners that might not have known about, you know, A, the processes and, and the contract distillation, but as well as the visitor experience and really what you get and you got to make sure that you put this as a stop on the trail when you come. We tell everybody to do it. Yeah, these guys get it. Like from the get-go when, you know, even the early days when you were just starting to distill, you, you always had that hospitable mindset and like, come in, like hang out, let's be friends. And we have become friends and now business partners. So we're ex- always excited to spend time with you guys and we love coming here. It's such a great experience for us and everyone, everyone that comes here is always blown away by it. So kudos to you all for setting that up and, you know, you know, Nick, being from Barstown, just it's pretty cool to see this all come together. You know, you never thought no one cared, you know, 15, 20 years ago. And yeah. now it's a destination. So it's very humbling and 
uh, glad you all did it. So That's wonderful, wonderful to hear. Thank you. So of course you could follow Bardstown Bourbon Company on all the socials. And Danny, I know you're on IG and Instagram. You want you want to pump that out oh, there, people? Danny Bardstown. <laughs> so it, it's cool to follow because I try to take pictures. It's just every day there's something special going on on site, uh, and, and I do my best to capture it. So yeah, if you want to see like what their new score is on the vintage library, you can always check Danny's yep, Instagram. Yep. That's where it's going to be. And now it's going to be French horn. So <laughs> yeah, we gotta I'll, get I'll that. Put a French horn do piece a TikTok on there. with it or something. Yeah, at Danny Bardstown. Hit me up. Nick, do you want do you want to put anything out there? You sure. want people to just stay uh, my, away from you? No, I, I love the people. So <laughs> Dan's not the only one. Uh, I'm trying to get my Instagram game up. Uh, I'm not quite Danny Barchtown, but uh, BBC underscore Whiskey Nick. That is me. So uh, I try to try to educate as much as possible and post what we're doing out in the distillery. So get very follow, cool. kind of behind the scenes. Mm-hmm. There you go. Well, awesome guys. Thank you again for joining the show and coming on today. And you know, Ryan it was definitely a good treat for us too. We're sitting here. Sipping oh, on this, gosh, which is yeah. fantastic. I don't think blend. we talked about the bourbon of man. That was good. Yeah, I know. <laughs> Hats off to the chef on on this one. It was a, yeah. it was a great blend. I'm about to pick his brain next time in the tasting lab. Let's do it. The hell of a <laughs> Just blender the chef up here. What are we doing? Yeah, <laughs> but make sure you follow Barstow Bourbon Company. Make sure you follow us on all the socials: Bourbon Pursuit on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and TikTok. We're there as well. And subscribe. Make sure you tell your friends about us. And with that, we'll see you all next week. Cheers. <laughs>